Okay, so for those who don't already know me, which I think is no one at this stage, my email and where to find me is on the board. Um, as you know, we're, going, we're only going to meet for tutorials once every two weeks for uh, an hour and a half. Um, you're going to notice that in the beginning of the course, in the entire course, but especially in the beginning, there are a lot of neurons in your head that have to be tweaked the other way. And because this tweaking takes a long time and, and is not that simple, I kindly asked the fact to get 30 minutes this week already so I can start tweaking your neurons. Uh, and this way, maybe the process will be a little less painful. It will be painful, but maybe it will be a little less painful this way. Um, so I'm just going to uh, give a brief introduction to some of the things that are sometimes missed. Uh, but that will be very helpful for understanding uh, what's going to come in the next 14 weeks or so. So the first thing I want, I want to talk about are the units that we use. So you're used to different types of units, uh, Gaussian units, SI units, and so on. Um, but the, the best kind of units, what sometimes are called God-given units, is the units where you choose both h bar, so reduced Planck's constant, and the speed of light, both to be equal to 1. Now, when I say that the, the speed of light, c, is equal to 1, I do not mean 1 meter per second. I'm not redefining the meter or the second. I mean that c is equal to the number 1. I'm defining velocity to be a dimensionless quantity. Okay. Right, dimensionless means unitless. Dimension and units is the same thing. Now, the reason this is a neat choice is because this has a couple of very uh, interesting consequences. So if you think about, uh, in relativity, about a massless particle, you know that the energy is equal to C times the uh, momentum, or for example, for a massive particle, massive meaning the opposite of mass less, it has a mass, the energy squared is equal to the rest mass squared plus the momentum squared. So if you plug in C is equal to 1, the number 1, this now means that the units of energy is equal to the units of momentum, is equal to the units of mass. In a way, we are used to thinking of energy in the units of joule. I know what one joule is from my daily experience. I measure momentum in kilograms times meter per second, and I know what the kilogram is, I know what a meter is, so I can relate to that. C, in a sense, is the quantity that translates momentum from units, so a quantity from units of momentum to units of energy, but they are the same thing. So for a massless particle, energy and momentum is exactly the same thing. If you talk about the energy of a massless particle, say a phonon or a photon, or you talk about its momentum, you're saying the same thing. The value is only different if you choose to use joules or units of momentum. But if you define c is equal to 1, they're exactly the same, also numerically speaking. And the same thing goes for h bar. If you think of quantum mechanics, remember the relations that the energy is h bar times omega. Omega is the angular frequency. And the momentum is equal to h bar k. If you now use the convention that h bar is equal to the number 1, then energy and um, frequency are exactly the same thing, and the same thing goes for momentum and the wave number. So from now on, when you talk about frequency or energy, you're talking about the same thing. And h bar is just the number you use to convert from units of radians per second to units of joules. But if you don't care about joules or radians per second, you just care about the actual number, then uh, they're exactly the same thing. And since we've already established that the 
uh, units of energy are equal to the units of momentum, this means that they are also equal to the units of frequency, so inverse time, and equal to the units of um, uh, the wave number or inverse length. Uh, so basically what I've done is, is I've taken all this mess of units that has been driving me crazy for the past three years and I've reduced it all down to one unit. Everything can be measured in units of, say, mass. Energy has units of mass. Momentum has units of mass. Time has units of inverse mass, so one divided by mass. There's only one unit left in your entire physics world. Okay? That's what this has done for you. And these are the units that we're going to use throughout the course. So this is uh, a small introduction into that. Uh, it takes some time to get used to it. Of course, it's, easy, it's much easier like you, for you, you, don't, you don't forget your, your constants anymore. But to actually understand the implications, it takes a little time to get used to. Um, so to start thinking about this and, and what this means, And I'll show you a few things right away now. So as I've said, the first thing that we're going to talk about starting from next week is uh, electromagnetism from the uh, point of view of, of uh, uh, field theory. So for this matter, let me just introduce uh, a few things that you already know about electromagnetism from previous courses. And then um, next week we'll be ready uh, at the point where we can apply the uh, field theory that you have established in the lectures and apply them to uh, electromagnetism. So let's start with Maxwell's equations. So there are two equations that are independent of the sources. When I write dou sub t, this means d dt. Okay, that's another notation that we're gonna have to get used to. So these are source independent. source are the charges of the currents. They do not appear in these equations. So these are the source independent uh, equations. And then we have the source dependent equations. These are source dependent. Now notice that you don't have to remember where the C's are and the dielectric constants and so on because we have just defined they're equal to one. So Maxwell's equations are much easier to remember. You have to remember the plus or the minus sign, which no one ever does remember. Source independent and source dependent. The sources of the electric and magnetic field are the charges and the current. These are sometimes also called homogeneous equations, which means that they're equal to zero, and these are called inhomogeneous because a derivative is equal to a number. So these are homogeneous and these are inhomogeneous equations. Because? Okay, this means that if I want to tell you um, what a certain field configuration looks like, I have to give you a certain number of uh, quantities. So for example, I have to tell you uh, all the three components of the electric field. So that's three degrees of freedom for the electric field. So let's count the degrees of freedom. So you have three degrees of freedom for the electric field. And then I also have to give you the three uh, components of the 
magnetic field, so that's another three. And in principle, there are another three components for the current and one more for the uh, charge, a total of 10 degrees of freedom. Let's assume for the moment that rho and j are both equal to zero, so that there are no sources. In this case, there are a total of six degrees of freedom. So in order to tell you in this room there is a certain electric and magnetic field, I have to tell you six numbers, ex, ey, ez, bx, by, bz, right? But as you know, you can also describe electromagnetism not by using fields, but by using the potentials instead. If I tell you the components of the electric potential, which I will call phi, and the three components of the vector potential, so that's a total of four degrees of freedom, then you know the um, values of the fields simply by the definition of the fields. So what this tells you is that it is more convenient to work in terms of the potentials than the fields. Because working in fields, there's a redundancy. You're working with six degrees of freedom, or you could be working of four. But there's the same physical information contained in these four degrees of freedom than is contained in these six degrees of freedom. And if I tell you the electric potential and the vector potential every point in space, you automatically know the electric and magnetic field every point in space. So all I have to do is specify these four quantities and you already know these six, right? There were a few questions? No, there is a A, sorry. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense otherwise. OK, so it will always be better to work in, term, in terms of uh, the electric and magnetic or vector potential, which is what we're going to do. Notice even uh, more importantly is that um, two of the equations, namely the homogeneous equations, are um, these two equations um, follow automatically from the definition of the potential. How so? If we take the first um, equation, and apply the curl on either side. So I'm going to apply curl on either side of this equation. So that's curl E equals curl minus grad phi minus dTA. The curl of a gradient is zero. zero by definition. So that vanishes. And we're left with what we had over here. Curl E is the left hand side. On the right hand side, I switch the order because this is a spatial derivative and this is a temporal derivative. I can switch the order. So I first take the curl of A by definition B and then minus dt. Let's move to the other side, so I get a plus. Plus dTB is equal to zero. So that's this equation. By defining the potential, I don't even need this equation. This equation is contained in the definition of the potential. Okay? You can do the same thing for uh, the second definition, if you apply 
the divergence on both sides of this equation, then the divergence of a curl again is equal to zero, and you automatically get div b equals zero, which is the second inhomogeneous maximal equation. So this is unnecessary. This is unnecessary. So I've done two things. You can even see this. So I've already done two good things by introducing um, the potentials. First, I've reduced the degrees of freedom from 6 to 4. And second, I have omitted, I've, got rid, I've gotten rid of two of the Maxwell equations. Okay? Magic, right? What about the remaining two equations? So the remaining two equations at the moment, the main two Maxwell equations, at the moment are formulated in terms of fields. And I want to formulate them in terms of potentials, and that way I can totally forget about the fields, right? And to do this, I'm going to introduce uh, what's called the covariant formalism. Some of you may have studied it in the end of last year, the end of your undergraduate degree. So I'm going to induce what you probably remember as F mu nu. I'm going to remind you of the formalism. Um, with that, more or less, then I'll introduce the Lagrangian, then with that we'll end uh, for today. So in order to introduce covariant formalism, we first of all have to uh, use some uh, notion. So I'm going to introduce four vectors. And then there's this thing about the lower and upper index, remember? So I'm going to call, let's take the uh, displacement for a vector. So if I write x with a lower index, what I mean is the four vector time and minus r vector, so minus x, minus y, minus z. And if I write x mu with an upper index, they're all positive. I guess that most of you, when you saw this for the first time, you were, you were used to writing c times t, so speed of light times t and then r, so that they would all have the same units. Again, this is irrelevant, because we have to find c is equal to 1, so time and length have the same units. Units of inverse mass, right? So I can forget about c. This is just t and minus r. Lower index means there's a minus on all three spatial coordinates. Upper index means everything is positive. In order to get from one to the other, you use uh, the metric, which I call g mu nu. There's a summing convention, so you have to sum over the repeated index, which in this case is nu, and g mu nu of the elements of g mu nu which is the matrix G, which are equal to the elements of lower index G mu nu, 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1, and zeros on the off diagonals. X lower nu, you sum over one upper and lower index. And you end with the upper index. Yeah. That's what I wrote. Right. Hmm? You always sum over one upper index and one lower index. And when you do this, you can, you can plug it in. So this is lower index t minus r. You multiply it by this matrix and you get all positive signs, right? So let me just write down an, uh, another uh, few four vectors that will be useful. So there's the four vector of current, j mu, which is equal to rho and minus j. Again, no speed of light, it's equal to 1. 
there's the four vector of potential, which is equal to the electric potential and the four and the three components of the vector potential. Um, and one very important one and very confusing one, the four gradient, which is time derivative and spatial gradient, where the lower index has a plus sign. So unlike all of the other four vectors where the lower index has a minus sign, when it comes to, when it comes to derivative, the lower index has no minus sign, but the upper index derivative comes with a minus sign, unlike all the other four vectors. So pay, pay, pay special attention to this case. Where are we? Yeah, it's the derivative with respect to time, and then gradient, which is dx, dy, dz, the three components. Again, no c because c is equal to 1, right? So charge, I didn't mention it earlier, but in using this convention, uh, you see it here. Using this convention, uh, electric field and magnetic field, let's look at this equation. I'll make it much easier. This is inverse length, right? This is inverse time. It has the same units, right? Same unit. That means that magnetic field and electric field have the same units, yeah. right? Which means that charge, that the current has the units of um, electric field divided by time, which is the same as electric field divided by length, which is this. So also rho and j have the same units. Right? So you don't need anything here either. Yeah, but you still have the charge in the, in the So the units would be... Um, it's not like you can say charge is the energy or something. No, wait a minute. Charge would have to be... The electric field is square root of energy. And this is an inverse, an inverse time, so it's also an energy. So it's energy times the square root of energy, so it's energy to the 3 halves, or mass to the 3 halves. It's the same unit, just with a different power. It's always that same one unit, which we usually call the mass, but that's just a convention. You could call it the length or you know, energy or whatever. And it's also different power. So the power in this case would be 3 halves. Okay, so we're getting to where we want to get. We are now in the, we now have the notation that we need to define the um, electromagnetic field tensor. So let's go ahead and do so. And the way it is defined is as follows. It is a tensor, so it has, it's a second order tensor. It has two indices, f mu nu. And it is defined as the partial derivatives of a, it's d mu a nu minus d nu a nu. Very importantly, there is no summation here. And it works out with our summation convention because we only sum over indices if they appear twice in the same term. So over here, mu appears twice in the same term. So you have to sum over it. We don't sum over mu because it only appears once. Also in this case, d mu a mu, there's no summation because mu and mu only appear once. Same thing for this term. So there's no summation convention here at all. These are, you, you go with mu from 0 to 3, there's so a total of 16 different numbers. F mu mu is a shorthand notation for 16 different numbers. 
M of them are zero. You can check automatically that this tensor is anti-symmetric. If you switch mu and mu, you get a minus sign, which means that the diagonal uh, elements are equal to zero because it has to equal its minus, right? If you write out the tensor, this is what you probably did. Um, for the summer holidays, again, there are no c's and so on because c is equal to 1. Um, where E1 is EX, right? E2 is EY. I'm using numbers instead of XYZ. So this is a tensor. And if you want, you can also write the uppercase tensor. So if you knew uppercase, you have to apply G twice. So you have G mu sigma G a new rho times f sigma rho. The summation convention tells me that I have to sum over sigma because it appears twice. And I have to sum over rho because it appears twice. But there is no summation over mu and nu. And when you do this, I encourage you to use your fingers and do this at home. What you'll notice is that you get basically the same tensor. The only thing that changes sign are the uh, electric fields. The internal part, the, the Bs, remain exactly the same. So you get minus E1, minus E2, minus E3, E1, E2, E, and then this part remains exactly the same. So this notation, using the, the covariant and, and contravariant matrices uh, and, and four vectors, um, is a very useful notation. I encourage you to use it as much as possible between now and until you finish doing physics, um, so that this becomes a second language for you. This is a very useful notation, and it takes some time to get used to. I'm saying this on purpose. It takes some time to get used to, which is why I'm and I'm sure you've met it before. So I encourage you to do calculations like this. Um, if you do them often enough, you'll be able to do them in your head. Of course, the big advantage uh, of this uh, electromagnetic field tensor, F mu nu, is that we can now write the remaining two maximal equations in a very simple form. So the inhomogeneous Maxwell equations or the source dependent equations are now simply d mu mu nu equals j nu. And I encourage you to do this at home, do this derivative uh, and, and, and verify this. Now, I'm sure you've done it before. And the way you usually would do it is that you would write out the terms as they are, then go to the matrix and start plugging in the fields. But that's not a smart thing to do, because we just I just told you for 20 minutes why fields are stupid and you should be using potentials. Remember that f mu nu is defined, and this is the definition that I really want you to remember is defined in terms of the potential. The definition of f mu nu is d mu a nu minus d mu a nu. Try to say that three times quickly. So what I want you to remember is this definition. Here I'm using only the potentials. The four degrees of freedom, a0, which is the electric potential, phi, 
A1, A2, A3, which are AX, AY, and AZ. And I would like you to try and verify that this reduces to the two inhomogeneous Maxwell equations when you plug in this definition for F mu nu, and then think about what happens when you take d mu of this expression. What is d mu, d mu, a mu? And what is the second term, d mu, d mu, a mu? So I'd like you to start thinking about these kind of things uh, as a preparation for next week. Let me just give you one more uh, thing that I would like to talk to you about uh, and encourage uh, next week's lectures, and that's the Lagrangian for electromagnetism. So the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian density of electromagnetism is minus some constant, which we'll find next week, times f mu nu, times f mu nu. It's getting worse by the second, right? And now we have, we have one f mu nu, now you have two f mu nu's. How great is that? So it's f mu nu times f mu nu, where there's a, a summation over both mu and nu. There must be a summation because L, which by the way has units of energy density, and density is energy to the third, so it has dimensions of en so energy to the fourth. Um, so it's a number basically, and these are tensors. And of course, the result on the left hand side cannot depend on the indices mu and nu, so obviously you have to sum over them. So this is the term uh, that is responsible for the vacuum, and then there's one more term, so there's no minus sign, just C1. C1 f mu nu f mu nu, plus some other constant C2 times the source terms which come in as a mu times j mu. So it's a mu j mu. Again, you're summing over the repeated index, which is mu. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to use the older Lagrange equations and see how from here we get back to the Maxwell equations. So from here, we're going to go back to Maxwell's equations. Um, we're going to find the constant C1 and C2 uh, as an exercise, we're going to solve these derivatives. So those of you who are going to try this are going to have an easier time doing this because this is like five times more complicated than this. So I very much encourage you to do this to make this much simpler. So far for the physics. Um, any questions about the physics? Before I say two more things about Covariant means this, contravariant means this. Here you're using both to rewrite the equation. The equations always have a mixture of both. Yeah. Right? A, a full vector can be either co or contravariant. No, I meant is there a, like you can write a equation Right, so we're, so we're going to do next week. We're going to use uh, the other Lagrange equations. I'm going to show you how to use them for uh, our coordinates, the four components of A, and we're going to arrive here. Okay? So this is just uh, a promo for, for next week. So let's deal with that uh, in course next week. Okay, so um, for those of you who have opened Moodle before you came here, you saw I put a lot of books online, a lot of PDFs with a lot of books, uh, a lot of heavy reading. So first of all, my tutorials are online, and I'm going to try and upload them uh, a long time in advance, at least a few days, if not a week in advance. 
Um, the first tutorial is online, and we've now covered the first two or three pages. There's another seven or eight pages, which we're going to cover next week. So I very much encourage you to look at them, go through them, work with them, so when you come, you already know what's going on. Because as I said, there's a lot of neuron tweaking going on in this class, so it is very helpful to look at it and, and go over it before I you know, throw it at you. So I very much encourage you to do that. and I. Uh, Unlike undergraduate, where I encourage you to do it here, I actually expect you to do it. You're now master students, you've now come a long way, so I actually expect you to look and to prepare yourselves for lectures and uh, exercises. To make this a little easier for you, if you go to the last page of the tutorial, I have included a reading list of recommended chapters in different books. Um, and I've divided it into different sections. So there's like the most important reading, and then there's more like the background reading. So depending how much time you have and how much how interested you are, uh, you can read more or less. Uh, but I'm already pointing you in the direction of uh, certain chapters that I personally think are very helpful and that I personally read and helped me when I was in your, in your place. Um, so I encourage you also to look at them. And all of the books that I reference, I've uploaded a PDF. So you don't even have to walk up to the fifth floor. You can just download the PDF and read it on your uh, computer or whatever. Okay? So work hard, because this is going to be necessary. Um, and let's have a good semester. See you next week.